Good morning. In today's headlines, we have the latest on the manhunt going on in Texas. Hear what concerned neighbors have to say about the suspect. Could there be a movement on raising the debt ceiling? In the wake of a default warning by Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, President Biden summons the top four congressional leaders to the White House. The Supreme Court has agreed to hear a major case on limiting the power of the federal government. We speak to a legal expert. At least six people are dead after a dust storm turns fatal in Illinois. This after more than 70 vehicles crashed on a stretch of highway. And what's driving people to leave the Golden State in such large numbers? We hear from the host of California Insider about the deeper reasons. Good morning. I am welcome to NTD. I'm Tiffany Meyer in for Kevin Hogan. Yeah, we're really keeping her busy these days. I'm Evelyn Lee. Today it's Tuesday, May 2nd. Indeed, there's lots of news, and while you're getting ready or commuting to, commuting to work, we'll keep you updated. Yeah, so let's re get right into it. We're starting off with some news out of Oklahoma today. Authorities found seven bodies on a property yesterday. That was during a search for two missing teenage girls. Investigators believe the girls were with a 39-year-old registered sex offender. The surge led them to his residence. The local sheriff says he believes the girls are among the dead and that the other bodies likely include the sex offender and members of his family. The bodies were found near the town of Henrietta. It's a town of about 6,000 people, about 90 miles east of Oklahoma City. And next over to Texas for the latest in the manhunt there. The suspect, accused of killing five of his neighbors, is still at large. Officials say U.S. Border Patrol officers are on high alert. But it is possible he's already escaped to Mexico. The suspect at large is 38-year-old Francisco Oropesa. He's reportedly a Mexican national that's been deported at least four times in the past. Residents of Cleveland, Texas, where the shooting happened, say they want justice. Here's what people in the neighborhood had to say. There might be friends or, or ties with him out here that could be hiding him. Um, it's scary because school just started on Monday and they still haven't found him. He could have had somebody escort him out of the neighborhood, found a place to hide. Uh, the community's definitely on high alert. Uh, we're on edge, nervous, scared. Uh, we want the coward caught. Over 250 law enforcement officers are involved in the search. Authorities are asking the public for tips. An $80,000 reward is being offered for information that leads to an arrest. The U.S. could be as close as a month away from a default. That's according to the latest estimates by Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. Here are the details. Secretary Yellen addressed the $31 trillion debt ceiling in a letter to House Speaker Kevin McCarthy on Monday. Yellen wrote, after reviewing recent federal tax receipts, our best estimate is that we will be unable to continue to satisfy all of the government's obligations by early June, and potentially as early as June 1st, if Congress does not raise or suspend the debt limit before that time. Yellen estimated in January that the Treasury would be able to handle the nation's debt through early June, but she made the latest estimate due to lower than expected tax receipts this spring. House Republicans passed McCarthy's budget proposal last month. It would raise the debt limit by $1.5 trillion. It's enough to carry the government into early 2024, but the increase comes with a number of spending cuts and caps. President Biden has refused to negotiate with Republicans on the proposal, saying raising the debt ceiling should come without any conditions. Yellen says last-minute actions on the debt ceiling risk harming consumer confidence and can cause the country's credit rating to be lowered. She says Congress should protect the faith and credit of the U.S. by acting immediately. McCarthy has repeatedly said raising the debt limit should come with serious discussions about curbing federal deficit spending. President Biden has summoned the top four congressional leaders to the White House next week. This after Secretary Yellen's default warning. It prompted Biden to call for the meeting with leaders, including House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, on, way on May 9th. Biden called McCarthy in Jerusalem, where he is on a diplomatic trip. He also reached out to House Democratic Leader Hakeem Jeffries, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, and Republican Leader Mitch McConnell. President Biden and others reacted. For over 200 years, America has never, ever, ever failed to pay its debt.
The full faith and credit of the United States cannot be held hostage. He treats it just like the border. He wants to ignore it, thinks it goes away. That doesn't work in America. He's putting the American economy in jeopardy by his lack of action. Since 1789, the United States has always paid its bills on time. In 2011, a similar debt ceiling fight took the country to the brink of default and prompted a downgrade of the country's top-notch credit rating. The Supreme Court agreed on Monday to hear a major case on limiting the power of the federal government. It could have broad implications on government regulation. The case is between Herring Fishermen and the National Marine Fisheries Service. The fishermen say the agency doesn't have authority to make them pay the salaries of government monitors who ride on their fishing boats. By taking the case, the Supreme Court will reconsider a 1984 ruling known as the Chevron Doctrine. It deals with federal agencies' interpretation of law. The case will be heard next term, with a ruling likely in 2024. And joining us now is Oliver Dunford to help us understand this case. He's a senior attorney at the Pacific Legal Foundation. Good morning, Oliver. Can you please start by summarizing what that Chevron Doctrine is and what role has it played in the past? Sure, good morning. Uh, Chevron uh, refers to a 1984 Supreme Court decision uh, in which the court deferred to the interpretation of a law by a administrative agency. Uh, basically, the question comes down to who gets to write the law. Is it Congress or is it an agency that's part of the executive branch? And so what courts have done under the Chevron doctrine is uh, it's called the Chevron two-step. First, uh, the court is supposed to decide whether the statute addresses the dispute uh, directly. And if so, then the court just applies the law. But uh, under step two, if there's an ambiguity in the statute, then the court will apply the agency's interpretation so long as that interpretation is reasonable. Um, and the problem with that is, is that it gives a lot of power to administrative agencies uh, to claim that there's ambiguity in the law. And then, as in this case, uh, they can stretch that authority uh, and try to do things that Congress has not allowed them to do. And of course, there's, on the other hand, people defending the Chevron Doctrine. Um, but there's also the idea that people who weren't elected shouldn't make important decisions for voters, for instance. Can you tell us a bit more about the tensions there are and what your take is on it? Sure. The defenders of Chevron say that uh, the modern world is very complex, uh, that Congress can kind of set broad uh, rules but that experts in the administration are needed to fill in the details. And that's all that's going on here. Uh, the critics of Chevron would say that they're doing more than that, that the agencies are, in fact, writing the law, uh, taking advantage of perhaps ambiguous language uh, to stretch their authority beyond what they actually have. Uh, and the, again, the problem is uh, that not that there's an ambiguity in the law. That, that happens at times. The problem is who gets to decide uh, who resolves that ambiguity. Uh, and in the United States, the ambiguity on questions of law are supposed to be decided by the courts and not by administrative agencies. So mm. uh, what you have here basically is administrative agencies trying to uh, write the law, and then when a dispute comes up, they're trying to resolve all the disputes too. Um, and a, a key feature of the separation of powers of the U.S. government is that Congress writes the law, the executive enforces it, and then when disputes arise, the courts uh, resolve those disputes. Mm. Right. And now what happens, let's say, if um, this doctrine was overruled, what could be the broader impact of that? And how do you see it affecting future regulations? Yeah, this would make uh, Congress uh, be more active. Um, right now, Congress writes laws that are broadly worded in, in some cases. Uh, and then when something goes wrong, Congress can say, well, that was the agency's uh, problem. In this case, the National Marine Fisheries Service, or it could be the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, they, can, they can push all of the uh, blame uh, on agencies. So this will make Congress write the laws more carefully. Uh, it will also require agencies to, to apply the law strictly as it's actually written. Um, one decision that um, comes up often in these discussions is a case called Brand X. And in that case, uh, an agency uh, actually took an opinion that was contrary to a previous uh, court opinion. And the Supreme Court upheld the agency's interpretation, even though it contradicted an earlier court decision. 
again, because the court said that the interpretation was reasonable. So uh, one result of uh, if Chevron is overturned is that we should have more predictability in the law. Uh, agencies will have to um, more closely follow the actual words of the text. Right, and that's very interesting that it would give more responsibility back to, ability back to the Congress. So thank you so much for breaking that down for us. Oliver Dunford, I appreciate it. Thank you. Is your money safe at the bank? With all the recent high-profile bank collapses, many are wondering, and the experts say not necessarily. NTD's Chris Spears finds out what you can do to protect yourself. Some of the biggest bank failures in U.S. history have occurred in just the past two months. Many are wondering, is my money safe? If you're within the bounds of federal deposit insurance protection, your money is safe. In that case, the risk of a bank failure, that's the bank's problem. That's not your problem. Greg McBride is the chief financial analyst at Bankrate.com. He says the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, or FDIC, insures all deposits for up to $250,000 at FDIC-insured banks. So if you have less than that amount at a bank, that money is safe. If you have deposits that exceed that uh, Federal Deposit Insurance limit, regardless of how healthy that bank may be, that's a risk you're taking that you're not being compensated for. Most banks in America are FDIC insured, but not all of them are. This could include foreign banks or credit unions, which are not technically banks and may have different insurance. Be sure to ask your bank if it's FDIC insured, and the FDIC insures you for every account category you have money in. For example, you would be fully insured if you had $250,000 inside an individual account and a trust account and a joint account and a retirement account, all at a single bank. You can also have accounts at multiple banks. We have always been bank diversified and always kept, you know, our assets in multiple banks at a time just because things can happen and it just makes it a little safer. Rachel McCrary is the CEO of tech startup Gather Labs. She moved her money from First Republic to JP Morgan back in early March. She was one of the startup founders caught up in the early banking crisis. If you're an early stage company and your assets are frozen and you can't make payroll, this can be detrimental and almost unrecoverable from from, from like an early stage startup perspective. Another way to protect your money, some banks have special programs that can insure you for well over $250,000. That is available to larger uh, depositors if you need over two fifty. dollars um, have substantially higher limits. Uh, you know, we've seen to the tune of 30, 40, 50 million dollars. So there are options for those wealthy folks. Lawrence Sprung is the founder of Midland Financial. He's been working in finance for 26 years. Sprung says we can find which banks offer this service by going to intrafinetworkdeposits.com. Simply type the name of a financial institution into the search bar and hit enter. Chris Beers, NTD News. The White House addressed the issues of First Republic Bank yesterday. It says Americans will not have to pay for the mistakes of the severely mismanaged bank. To a dust storm in Illinois that left at least six dead yesterday, this after more than 70 vehicles crashed on a major highway. And today's Daniel Monaghan has more. The crashes along Interstate 55 happened shortly before 11 a.m. in Montgomery and Sangamon counties. Massive clouds of dust from newly plowed fields blew across the highway, causing zero visibility. Besides the people killed, 37 others were hospitalized, with injuries ranging from minor to life-threatening. Those injured in the wrecks ranged in age from 2 to 80 years old. 72 vehicles were involved in the crashes, which happened along a two-mile stretch of I-55. Two semi-trucks also caught fire. The flashing lights of first responders could be seen glowing in the clouds of dust and smoke as a thick yellow haze hung in the air over the highway. First responders encountered multiple vehicles on fire and dozens of vehicles scattered across both sides of the road. That made it hard to get to victims in a rapid manner. The wrecks happened in both north and southbound lanes, but all deaths were reported in northbound lanes. The interstate in southern Sangamon and northern Montgomery counties were still closed the late Monday evening as officials investigated and cleared vehicles. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. 
Coming up, members of the Writers Guild of America are picketing across the U.S. today. Find out why they're staging their first strike in 15 years. And what's driving people to leave the Golden State in such large numbers? We hear from the host of California Insider about the deeper reasons. I am blind, but I may not see. Mm. I know this road is there for me. If I'm really free. Did you know ESG is impacting every part of your life? From rising gas prices to global food shortages to out of control inflation, even losing your freedom of speech and being censored on the internet. It's all being driven by ESG ideology. Who's in control? What can you do about it? Find out in The Shadow State, the first documentary exposing ESG. The ESG movement of governments and corporations operates in the shadows. Only the light of truth can expose it. Watch The Shadow State documentary, streaming now. Welcome back. Members of the Writers Guild of America are going on strike across the U.S. today. The walkout will throw a wrench in production for many of Hollywood's major studios. Union negotiators were unable to reach a deal with the alliance representing the studios. The two sides were trying to iron out a new three-year contract. The old contract expired last night. The union wants improved compensation and royalties from streaming programs. They also want health and pension plan reform. The alliance cited demands around mandatory staffing levels and length of employment as the main points of contention. The work stoppage will take away jobs for crew members and affect a range of others in the film industry. The strike has the potential to go on for weeks or even months. The last strike by the Guild was in 2007. It lasted 100 days. And more banking job cuts. Wall Street giant Morgan Stanley is reportedly letting go of 3,000 employees. It comes as the bank faces a slump in deal making. Sources told the Financial Times that management is looking to cut about 5% of its 82,000 staff. The areas hit the hardest include the secretaries and investment banking divisions. Last month, the bank had less mergers, IPOs, and debt financing. This led to their revenue from investment banking taking a 24% hit. And speaking of scaling down, IBM may pause hiring on jobs it thinks artificial intelligence could replace. And it's, the CEO actually said that up to 30% of back-to-office employees like human resources could be replaced by AI or automation over the next five years. Right. And when you do the math, that's almost 8,000 jobs. So this plan is one of the biggest labor changes in response to AI. And speaking of scaling down, there's been a mass exodus in some states as families and businesses seek greener pastures. California alone is losing half a million residents since the pandemic. To find out what's behind these numbers, we sat down with Siamak Karami to learn more about his new documentary, Leaving California, The Untold Story. Siamak Karami, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you on the show. Thank you, Tiffany. I'm excited to be here. And recently, it seems California's population dropped by 700,000 people over two years. And you have a new documentary out called Leaving California, The Untold Story. So what did you find in this? You know, the population, there was actually 700,000 people that left the state. More people left the state that came in. But the population actually dropped by 500,000 people because we had the birth. We had 200,000 births. In this process uh, of going out, and what we did is we went out of the studio. We actually went and met Californians who left, and we interviewed them to find out why they left. And um, we, we went one layer deeper to figure out what's the reason behind the reason. So, for example, if people left for housing costs, we tried to figure out why are the housing costs higher. And then we figured out people have left because of the policies of the state. A lot of times the issues that people face, why they're leaving is connected to the policies that the state has. Or there was a certain law that, for example, there's a law that legalizes theft. 
under $950. When I say legalize, as you can still get in trouble, but you get a ticket, and it doesn't matter how many times you steal, you can keep going back, and each time if you get caught, you, you can get a ticket. So there's laws like that that are causing people to get frustrated. Somebody's business gets broken in time after time, and then they decide to leave. But they don't really see that. They just say, okay, it's not safe anymore. And on that note, it seems another maybe major concern is crime. I was down there recently and nearly got mugged. So what did you find in that aspect? Oh, wow. Yeah, so the, the crime is, it's uh, one thing that's happening is that a lot of the papers um, in California, they're saying statistics, uh, saying the crime is down. Crime is not up. Statistics are not showing that. But a lot of people don't report the crime anymore. Because they, they just, what, what can you do about it? If you get somebody mugs you and you call the police once and they didn't come or didn't, they didn't take it seriously because their hands are tied. The, the laws doesn't, or if it's a small thing, the laws don't really help them. Uh, so, so then what will happen is you actually, you have numbers that are wrong and average people may not really feel the whole picture unless it happens to you. So when it happens to you, then you start figuring out, oh, wow, this is really bad. Things are getting bad. We talked to some business owners that have been in the process of making this documentary and very resilient people that have been um, robbed multiple times. And then at their business, at their home, and this is, it keeps on happening. And what's happened is it has become very brazen now. People are coming into the stores and they just take things. And, and uh, they even threaten the business owners if, if uh, they confront them. And CMAC, actually, on that note, you're still in California. Do you have any plans on leaving? Absolutely not. This is a very beautiful state. And I think that once people of California will figure out what's going on, that they will, they will make changes here. And even the policymakers, probably, even the same ones could make changes. And this documentary, uh, Leaving California, is... Could, could be a path for people to get to see what's going on, to get a good big picture of what's going on in the state. Sounds like in a way, you know, the future is still hopeful. There's all those songs about California dreaming. Is that going to become reality again? I think so. I think if, if people can, these problems that we have are not very difficult to solve. It's just, there just needs to be the will of the leaders to, to actually solve them, to look at them and say, okay, you know, what we did was wrong. Let's fix this law. Let's fix that law. It's, it's doable. Well, see you, Matt Karami. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And if you'd like to watch it, you can find his documentary at epochtimes.com slash epoch TV. In lighter news, driving, flying, and working machines filled an airport in a California coastal town over the weekend. Enthusiasts and collectors showcased their prized possessions for all to see. That's coming up after the break. The Fixture Pioneer, CGM. Professional AI intelligent fixtures. All-round integration of four systems. High precision. High durability, high quality, two micrometer repetition accuracy, more than 80 patent certificates, ISO 9001 approved. Precision clamping to meet your every need. CGM has it all. Pride of Taiwan, CGM. The streaming platform from Shenyun, featuring world-class dance, past programs, and all original music. Master classes, behind the scenes, and more. Order now and save $100 on annual subscriptions at shenyuncreations.com slash TV. Good to have you back. Crowds of enthusiasts and collectors flock to ha Half Moon Bay Airport on Sunday. The Pacific Coast Dream Machine fundraiser returned after three years. It showcased about 2,000 driving, flying, and working machines from the 20th and 21st centuries. And today's David Lamb hears from some of the professional collectors. This was the marine, you know, this, these came out of boats. 
So this is kind of a, just a nice little running engine. 47 year old Robbie Peter has been collecting engines since 14 years old. He now has tons of them from the 1900s. This is only a small part of his collection he's showcasing at the annual Pacific Coast Dream Machine in Half Moon Bay. Are these all gas powered? Yeah, yeah. Everything we have here today is gasoline or propane because the oil fields, uh, they had natural gas. Hobbyists and collectors alike share and trade parts to fix their engines because he says you can't get the parts from a regular well, auto parts store. Like earlier today, a guy came to me and said, hey, I have an old hammer mill. I, I want it to go to a good home. So he actually gave it to us to, uh, I'm going to restore it when I get it. The craft holds a special place in his heart. Unfortunately, there's not as many younger generation that are collecting. Uh, because I don't know if they have the interest, but I, re I believe everything revolves and eventually we will get a younger generation to come back and start collecting when I'm old. Even at this festival, you get a chance to ride on World War II vehicles. And it's from the American Armory Museum and is the first time arriving at this festival. One collector wanted to support veterans and show people what soldiers went through. What got me into the military collecting is one, um, I believe in our military. Although I was never in the military, I support our military. You get excited about bringing back history. If you're a history buff and you love history, it's nice to drive the real thing. This is the Dream Machine's 30th year, making a return from a three year hiatus out of the pandemic. I like it a lot. Yeah, it was yes. fun. Yes. <laughs> Part of the history. That pumping is part of history. It was in a real world war. The annual event sends its proceeds to nonprofits like the Coastside Adult Health Center. Reporting in Half Moon Bay, California, David Lamb, NTD News. Some fascinating machinery, and I would have loved to climb into that tank, to be honest. It does look like David was having the time of his life covering. It sure does, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of surprises, a principal at an elementary school in Virginia got quite the surprise yesterday morning. James Marsh was caught on camera while opening a school trash dumpster. A black bear poked his head out, inches away from him. The two then ran in opposite directions, with the bear heading toward a wooded area. And the encounter did not lead to any reported injuries for Marsh or the bear. Glad both are safe, but I just wonder how that bear got stuck there. <laughs> Indeed, I wonder that too. Authorities have not said how the bear ended up in the dumpster. What a pity. All right, that's all for today's program. We're wrapping it here. Write us if you'd like at goodmorning at ntd.com. Thanks for watching. I'm Evelyn Lee. And I'm Tiffany Meyer. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.